Welcome to ETA, um, this Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, whenever you're taking part, uh, afternoon, evening, morning, you will notice that I am wearing the same shirt as I was wearing in the last video, if you are tracking along with the videos. And that's because these two videos were made on the same day. Surprise. Um, and so just wanted to clear that up so that you're not confused about why I look exactly the same as I did in the last video. Hat, hair, and everything. Um, it's the same day. Um, let's jump into John chapter 15 and 16 for our teaching time today. There's a lot going on here. I say that all the time. Um, it is a struggle to feel like you can, you've pulled out and encouraged with the truth of two chapters in like 12 to 15 minutes, but here we go. We're going to take a shot at it. Come along. Here we go. Starting in chapter 15, John chapter 15, verse 1. I am the true vine. My Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may, be, may bear more fruit. These are really popular verses. These happen to be the last of John's seven recorded I am statements of Jesus. The I am statements of Jesus in the book of John are a massive piece. This is the last one. This one is different because it, it isn't just about I am this, but also my father is this. And so he includes the activity of his father in this one, which is, which is great. Um, when we hear these words, they need to bring our attention to the deity of Jesus. Jesus, the whole time, has been really defending his deity, whether he's saying, I was sent from the Father, or whether he's saying, everything the Father gives me to say, I say, everything the give Father gives me to do, I do, um, whether he is saying, I am, before Abraham was, I am, whether he's saying things like that, or, or really, whether he's just, or just, whether he's performing a miracle, he is, he's really proving his deity. He's proving that he is the Messiah um, and that he is eternal. And so he's proving these things, but our, we ought to come back to the deity of Jesus, that the word has become flesh. He is, in fact, God in the flesh. And these words he claim, with these words, he claims all authority and the eternal attributes of God. He says, I'm the true vine. There are and have been other vines, so he, but he is the true vine. This is the same word that's used in the prologue, which really just means ultimate. When, when it says the true light has come into the world in chapter 1, it means the ultimate, the, the unmatched, the, the unequivocal. There's, there's nothing like it. And, and there, there never will be, there never was, there isn't, and there never will be. He's, he is from the beginning to the end, the great. And so that's what it means here. He is the true vine. There have been other vines, but he is the true vine. They are false vines or counterfeit vines. Jesus has superseded and replaced Israel as the vine. And when you read through the Old Testament, Psalm chapter 80, you get this picture of Israel as the vine. It's not the only place. Ezekiel has it as well. But what Jesus is saying is, I am the true vine. I am the better Israel. I am the fulfillment of all that Israel was ever supposed to be. I am the true vine. Israel, and he produces fruit unlike the vine that was Israel, who produced rotten fruit. I can say this because most often when Israel is referred to as the vine, it's regarded to with it by its disobedience and its fruitlessness and its, and its necessity to be put off or cut off or, or to be disciplined. And, but Jesus says, I am the true vine. Um, and he says, every branch in me that bears fruit will be cut off. That could mean a few different things. It's most likely that people who have professed a relationship with Jesus have grown weary in doing good, and so have claimed to be in Christ by their profession, but fruitless by their lack of obedience. They don't relate enough to the vine. They are not spiritually aligned with the vine. They only claim it with their mouths and not with their lives. There's no fruit to give evidence that they are, in fact, disciples of Christ. To try and make a conclusive statement on the eternal security of those who are cut off from this vine is in, in just this passage is taking the imagery too far. I don't think that that's actually what this passage is teaching. I do believe that we are secure in Christ, that once we're saved, we're always saved. But what this is talking about is people who are identifying with the vine, kind of working around the vine, but never getting life from the vine. They're cut off. They're fruitless, and they're cut off. Cut off is used 16 times in the book of chapter of, of John, and, and lifted up is used eight times. What is clear throughout scripture is that there are no true Christians without some measure of fruit. There are either fruitful branches or dead wood. 
If they had fruit, they would have been pruned, but they've been cut off. The warning is stark. To be fruitless, though claiming Christ, is to be cut off and removed. The word cut off in the Greek is ario. I don't speak Greek. I haven't studied much of it, but I'm pretty sure that's how you say it. And it sounds like the word used for pruning, which is cathario. And this is where we get the word catharsis, which means cleansing. So to be pruned is to be cleansed. Every branch in me that bears fruit will be pruned. That, this expression, this, this statement, expresses the purpose of being of the branches to bear fruit. That's the whole purpose of a branch, is to bear fruit. And the expre- express purpose of pruning is that the branch would bear more fruit. So in the cleansing, in the nurturing, in, the, in, in all of that, that the branch would bear more fruit. So Jesus is saying, those who are identifying with me and, and don't bear fruit are cut off. And those who are in me and do bear fruit will be cleansed and purified, nurtured, and pruned. We can talk a lot about the uncomfortable process of pruning. You engaged with that um, in your study this week and and hope that that was fruitful for you this week. Abiding, Jesus now introduces this word abiding partway through chapter 15. If you abide with me, abide in me. And it simply has to do with remaining close to, to Jesus. You think about it in the, in the context of a vineyard. You can think about it in the context of a shepherd. The quantity and quality of the fruit in the vineyard is dependent on the proximity to the vine. Just like the quality of sheep depends on their proximity to the shepherd. And we get that out of John chapter 10. And so Jesus is, in a sense, saying the same thing that he has already said, but he's just using a now another word picture in his grace. He's using another word picture for us to identify with him. And so he introduces this concept of abiding or nearness to him, and then he illustrates it by contrasting his followers with the world. So if you abide in me, you'll obey my commands. If you abide in me, you'll do what I command, and and my love will remain in you, and your love will remain with me, and, and there will be this unity. And so he is talking about identity. He's talking about unity. He's talking about nearness. He's talking about um, that those branches that bear fruit is, is abiding. And so there's two types of people. This is what Jesus is saying. So he talks about this abiding, this nearness, and then he talks about there's another kind of people that are far away from me. And in, 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 this, in these, these chapters, he says, this is the world. And he talks about the hatred of the world. And he talks about the, the way that we, his followers, interact with that. There are two types of people to Jesus. There's his followers, and then there is the world. He tells his followers that the world will hate them and then outlines the kind of persecution they should expect to face and why. He tells them that the world will rejoice at their sorrow, likely talking about his crucifixion, but also, and in the same, with the same weight, talking about living the Christian life and the sorrow that comes there that is ununderstandable to the world and is even applauded um, when Christians suffer. And so he he talks about this, that they're going to rejoice at your sorrow. He tells them that in the face of this hatred, they will need to love one another because the world won't do it for them. You think about that, you read through this passage, and there's a couple, multiple times he's saying, you're going to, you need to love one another. Why do we need to love one another? Because the world is not going to love us. The world is not going to do it for us. We ought to love one another because we are, as, four, as, as chapter 14 said, we are indwelled with the Holy, same Holy Spirit. And so we have this love that transcends our, our, you know, our, our likes and dislikes, our preferences. It transcends that because we're, we have this unity in the Spirit. And so we ought to love one another because the world is not going to love us for us. It's not, gonna, it's not going to satisfy. It's not going to bring that kind of love. It's not going to bring that kind of communion um, and actually, James says that fellowship or friendship with the world is enmity with God. And so we ought to love one another. It's a big deal. And it's tied to the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. It's tied to abiding in Christ. It's tied to that there's really only two kinds of people. Those who are followers of Jesus and those who are of the world. And so, and then so he says, this is a big deal. <laughs> this is, you know, you need to love one another because the world is going to hate you. So if you start hating each other, you're just joining in with what the world wants to do to you. And he can, he, but then he brings this comfort to them with the promise of the Holy Spirit, calls him the helper. He says all of these things so that we, we his followers, might have peace. He says, I, I tell you all of this. At the end of chapter 16, he says, I'm telling you all of this 
so that you may have peace. So that you may have peace. Even in the midst of sorrow. As you did your homework this past week, I really wanted you to engage with Jesus' promise to transform our sorrow into joy. Notice, and I hope you noticed as you studied, that he doesn't promise to substitute our sorrow for joy. That would be a straight across instantaneous substitution. He doesn't promise that at all. Instead, he promises to transform it. The difference is that if all of a sudden the sorrow just became too much, he might just substitute it. But he's not a God of, he's not, he's not, he's not doing that. What he promises to do is transform. Your sorrow will turn into joy. Not be substituted for joy, but will turn into joy. This idea of transforming or changing um, and, and even over time. He promises to transform it. Very different than substituting it. He transforms our sorrow into joy. This is more of a process than an instantaneous substitution, which means that we will need to trust his promise of transformation as we live through the very real discomfort of our sorrow for as long as his sovereign hand allows. Sorrow and suffering is one of the non-negotiables of discipleship. ETA is formed around promoting and presenting the non-negotiables of discipleship. The non-negotiable of discipleship here is that in this world we will have trouble. But Jesus says, take heart, for I have overcome the world. I hope this is an encouragement to you. I hope you have a great time in your groups. God bless.